On November 9th, 1985, Danny Paquette was at home doing some welding work on a piece of equipment of his. He had a couple of friends working on the property that day. One was working on a car and another man was there to help. They would later say that all of a sudden they heard something that sounded like a loud crack. They would run to find Danny laid out on the ground, and at first they thought he was electrocuted. Fire trucks would be called to the scene. His friend would try CPR on him, and eventually would wonder what the wet liquid he was feeling was. And they wouldn't know it in that exact moment, but soon they would find out that anything but electrocution had happened to Danny Paquette that day. In fact, he had been shot from a far distance, from somebody in the woods, maybe an accident. Nobody really knew at that point. And in fact, it would take years before the truth came out as to who did it, and why they did it. But all along the way, a lifetime and a legacy of tragedy and loss would be unearthed in order to answer the question, who was responsible for Danny Paquette's death? Hello, Sofa Squad, and welcome back to the damn sofa. That's the sofa, and this is my sassy little sidekick, Mr. Roscoe P. Coltrane, and my name's Paul. Now, today, Buckle your sofa seat belts first of all. Our little teddy bear back here has his done. Y'all, today's case that we're talking about took me on so many different twists and turns, I didn't know what direction I was going in. Today we're gonna to be talking about the case of Danny Paquette. Now this case would go unsolved for a long time. And when it was finally solved, it stunned everybody. Well, not everybody, because some people in the town knew what happened. But it was such a shock. Now, for me, what was stunning or shocking about it is as I researched in this case, read about this case, everything that I did, it was like a legacy of tragedy and unsolved, solved crimes. And it just, every person had something to hide. There was a secret here, a secret there. And it went generational. And I was just like, my God, when does this stop? And I guess it kind of hopefully stopped with Danny Paquette's death. So what I want to do is talk about Danny Paquette and you know the baffling case of him. But in order to do that, we're going to have to talk about several other cases first so we can understand how we arrived to that day where Danny lost his life. So to get the full gravity of it, what we're gonna do first is we're gonna travel back in time to when Danny was a child and he experienced some of his first loss and unfortunately and sadly for him, that would be the loss of his own mother. Now the cases that we're talking about today, these have been featured in many TV shows, Unsolved Mysteries, podcast, books, and one of the books that I've read, I'm going to put the link down below for it. The book is called Our Little Secret, and it's by Kevin Flynn and Rebecca Lavoie. Now, this was an amazing book. I did it on audiobook. So, if after you hear this video or whatever, if you're like, this is really interesting, I absolutely recommend this book, uh, whether you read it or listen to it, because it has so many different intricate details in it that it will just keep your attention like that. It was an excellent story. The person reading the book and the audiobook was excellent, so keep that in mind. There's also tons of links to other articles and whatnot that I looked at uh, for information on this case, so be sure and check them out because, like I said, there's so many twists and turns in this case. It just baffled me how intricate this case was. And so let's go ahead and just jump on in and start talking about it. So let's start our journey on this story going back in time to the 1960s. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at two individual cases. Uh, these involve two young women uh, a few years apart and they would be linked to the same person. And bizarrely enough, this person would end up being linked to Danny Biquette's mother. So the first case that we're going to talk about is about a young woman named Sandra Vallade. Now she worked as a secretary in New Hampshire, Manchester, and this was during the winter time and she sounded like a very busy, energetic young woman. So one cold day in February 1960, she left work. Now unbeknownst to her, this would be the last time that she ever left work, unfortunately. So she leaves work and she goes and does some errands. She goes to the library, she goes and does some swimming classes at the YMCA, and then she goes off to a movie and like I said this sounds like a very busy young lady so she does all of these things and then she catches a bus and she's gonna go back home now it sounds like it was about like a mile long walk to get back home once she got off of this bus and that is the last time anybody would ever see her 
alive at least. Now she would never arrive back home to her parents, sadly. The following day, her belongings, like her purse, her wallet, her coat, things of that nature were found in a canal. Now it wouldn't be until nine days later that her body was found in a snowbank. Now she had met with a horrible fate. She had been assaulted in every way you can imagine. A gun had been used on her, knives had been used on her. It was brutal and it was absolutely no way to have your time stolen here on Earth. Now, in regards to who did this, no one ever found out the case would grow cold until a few years later. Now, let's fast forward a little bit to 1964. Again, it's a cold, wintry day. It's January 1964 in New Hampshire, and a young lady by the name of Pamela Mason would unfortunately meet her last day in this time. So Pamela had posted uh, one of those little flyers. I don't even know if they're still around anymore, but remember how you would do tear little things with phone numbers and somebody would tear it off and whatnot? Well, she did this for babysitting jobs. And so she posted it in this like local laundromat or whatever. So one evening she gets a phone call from a guy saying, hey, you know, we need a babysitter. And she's like, you know, okay, cool. This is what I do, right? So she leaves her parents' house, she heads out in the cold. Again, unbeknownst to anybody at this time, this is the last time she would be seen alive by those that loved her. Now her father would later learn that the address and phone number that was given to her actually belonged to like a little elderly woman who like didn't have any kids living in the home or anything. She didn't need a babysitter, so it was like fake. Now about eight days later, a truck driver would discover Pamela's belongings, uh, things of that nature, very similar to Sandra's stuff. Um, in a snowbank along Interstate Route 93. He would then also discover Pamela's body. She too had met a similar fate, very similar to Sandra and the way that she was taken from this earth. Okay, so let's jump back to Danny for a minute. Danny Paquette, his mother. His mother's name was Rena. His mother and her husband, Danny's father, his name was Arthur. Okay, so they had like a farm or whatever. Now, it wasn't in such a degree of that's what they made their soul living off of. So, Arthur worked. Rena had a little job or whatever, in addition to all the stuff that she did around the house. But Rena worked at a little laundromat. And as you might have guessed at this point, this is the laundromat that the victim, Pamela, had put her tearaway phone number flyer at. So here's where things get really strange. Eventually, Rena starts talking to her husband, Arthur, and she's like, I know who did it. You know, I know who did it. And of course, Arthur's like, what are you talking about? So when Arthur is confronting her and saying like, how do you know this? Rena will tell him, I know because the mother of the person who did it told me. Rena would tell her husband, Arthur, that she received a phone call and would continue to see, receive phone calls from a woman telling her that this is who did it, giving her the information. Now, what makes it even stranger is it's someone whom Rena worked with, and we'll get a little bit more into that. What makes it even more strange is that the person on the phone saying, I know who did it, was also saying, they did it in your pigsty on your property to Rena. So like I said, Arthur and Rena had like a farm, right? So they had a pigsty there, but the pigsty, because of the smell, things of that nature, they didn't want it really near the house. So while it was on their property, it was like away from the house, right at the barn area. So it wasn't anything that was like right out there or whatever. So this person who is calling someone who Rena works with at the laundromat saying, my son is the one who did it, is saying, and he did it in your barn and your pigsty. So so you can imagine, Rena's like, oh my God, like what do you do with that, right? Now, Arthur was like, absolutely be quiet. This is not our business. You don't get involved in that. Absolutely not, right? He was just telling her, uh-uh, yeah, no. This was a very, and still is, right? But compared to back then, I mean, this is a very tiny town where everyone knew each other. I mean, it was like, you just don't get involved in business like that, right? But for Rena, she was like, you know what, this it's gnawing at me, right? And that's a theme that we're going to see in this the multiple cases that we're going to talk about today. So Rena's like, it just kept gnawing at me and gnawing at me, knowing this. And it, she, she could not have a clear conscience on it, right? So she eventually contacts authorities. And she's like, I, I just have to tell you what I know. 
and, and she's gonna come clean about this. So what will end up happening is the authorities will come to the home to talk to her. And of course, Arthur's like, oh my God, like, are you kidding me? Like, no, just absolutely no, I'm not down for this. Now, when the authorities came and she told them all this, obviously they want the name and she's like, you know what? I'm being told that the guy who did this, his name is Edward Coolidge. Now, Edward Coolidge was a bakery delivery truck driver that will become prevalent. Uh, that's what he did. He was married. He had a daughter himself. Now, what is also very strange about this, remember how I said that it was somebody who Rena worked with? Okay, the person that Rena worked with that was calling this was the owner of the laundromat. So the owner of the laundromat is calling and saying that her son, who obviously has access there, he had stopped into the laundromat apparently. So he had seen this whole thing with the babysitting ad up there and all this. She is calling and saying that. Now in hindsight, because one thing that Arthur was asking her is why is she specifically calling you, right? And she was like, because she's saying it was done in our pigsty. And so there's that. Now, one thing in hindsight, when he was like, but why would she want to tell you or whatever? Rena would tell her husband, Arthur, I think she can't bring herself to turn her own son in. So it's almost like she's wanting someone else to do it kind of a thing. And, you know, looking at that, I'm just like, yeah, man, what do you do? Like in that kind of scenario. I mean, it's just, it's so wild to me. And again, remember, this is like the 1960s, right? So, I mean, this is probably extremely shocking for the small town during this time. Now, some other stuff that I found in research and whatnot, it looks like he had actually been let go of his bakery delivery job like semi-recently. So some things I found that seemed to conflict with that of was he let go after this began, but it was something to do with larceny. So there was definitely a lot going on with this guy, clearly in addition to what he you know, did to both these two women. Now, parallel to all the stuff going on with Rena and what she found out, investigators were still looking around at other things. They knew the 22 caliber, caliber, that was the weapon used in this, had something to do with this. So they started actually questioning people who had this gun and whatnot, and Edward was one of those people. Now, also, other things would start to not look good for him, right? So first of all, he would admit that, yeah, you know what? I had gotten my car stuck uh, on Route 93 that evening so yeah I was out there and he would say that a couple had helped him to get the car unstuck except the couple would place this incident happening way closer to where Pamela's body was found now also Edward would say you know what there's a few different guys that they can you know they're my alibi I've you know I've got this well when questioned they weren't able to cover his alibi now eventually when this did go to trial in 1965 different witnesses would get up there and say he gave several different stories as to where he was that evening and, and so none of his things added up in this at all right now also ballistics testing would show that that his weapon his 22 was what was used in both Sandra as well as Pamela's cases. Eventually, Edward was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. It would take an all-male jury just a little over four hours to return that verdict, but only for Pamela. Unfortunately, at the time, it was viewed like, why get him for both when we already have him for one? And as we're about to see, there was a very good reason to try and get him for both of them instead of just one. So in 1971, Edward appealed his conviction. The U.S. Supreme Court determined that a search of his vehicle had been done on a search warrant signed by the Attorney General, who later became the prosecutor for that trial. Now, the court basically came back with this and said, you know what, a more neutral party should have signed off on this warrant. And guess what? We're overturning the verdict. He's going to get a new trial. You can only imagine how upsetting this was for so many people. Number one, I mean, what a miscarriage of justice. I mean, and again, I'm a firm believer in dot your I's and cross your T's, and this is like a really bitter learning lesson right here, right? So anyways, so what ends up happening is they're going to go back to trial and all this type of stuff. But before that happens, he will end up taking a plea to avoid another trial. He would end up pleading guilty to a second degree M charge. Now, in 1978, he had served like 14 years at that point. Uh, he was up for parole, but he would get denied at this time. Now, he had completed college courses, had a pretty good record, and so he was doing well, but, you know, he didn't get that. 1982, just a few years later, like four years later, he would be granted parole. Now, there was like a petition of 21,000 people that signed it. 
asking the courts, the judicial system, whoever, do not give him parole. But he got parole and he was let out. Now, if that didn't burn your damn biscuits, you better hold on because this is going to. Okay, so remember how I told you that Danny's mother, Rena, she was getting these phone calls, you know, from Edward's mother, you know, way back when. And it was like, oh, my son did this, yada, 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 did it in your pigsty, all this type of stuff. The cops came over and all that, right? Okay, so we're back in time to this time where this is all actively unfolding. Okay, so one morning, Danny was allowed to sleep in. He had a dentist appointment. Now, usually, again, like this is a farm going on. You know, there's siblings, young men living in the house. Danny has a brother named Victor. So there was stuff to do in the morning. This is what I'm getting at. But on this morning, his mom was like, you know what? He can sleep in. He has a dentist appointment, so on and so forth. So Danny will recall waking up and having that feeling of like, well, wait a minute, something's off. Like, I've slept, it's too late. You know, and he saw the time and he's like, well, I slept past my dental appointment. Like, why mom let me do that? So he's getting up and looking around the house for his mother. He can't find her. He can tell that she's been up. You know, she had made her dad, his dad breakfast, that kind of stuff. So he starts looking around and again, he can't find her. So he's getting nervous at this point. So he calls his uncle and he's like, will you come help me look for mom? I can't find her. So the uncle comes over and they're like making their way around. They're looking around the property. And so they start to make their way toward the barn. And this is when I recall there was like some smoke coming from it. Something was off there. So when they go and open the barn door, now the uncle would try and shield Danny from this, right? But on the barn floor is the pigsty floor, like that area. His mother's charred, burning body is there. Obviously, she is no longer with us, right? She has lost her life in a horrifying manner. Now, remember, just to reiterate, this is the same place that she is saying that Edward took the life of someone, right? Coincidence? I don't think so. What's even more of a shocker is guess what? It wasn't ruled a homicide. This was ruled as the big S, that she did this to herself. One of the theories that was offered out there to the Paquettes, and they were just like, uh, yeah, no, is that she was really upset and forlorn over the recent tragedy involving Kennedy. So, yeah. Now, just a few very quick things about the crime scene. First of all, a log was used to hold the door shut. So, that alone should be a major red flag, right? No matches, no fire starter. She didn't smoke and she was afraid of fire. You, you do the math on that one. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this and this whole thing that went down right here is looking at this flimsy excuse being offered from the attorney general's office. Okay, because that dynamic, that whole thing, that burn, that situation offered from that is going to become prevalent when we start looking into Danny's death. Now, days later, after her funeral, when the Paquettes returned home, they realized that someone had set another fire in the pigsty area. It would be just one week later that Edward was arrested for the two girls, but he was never charged with Rena's death. Now, years later, Rena's body would be exhumed and the manner of death was switched from the big S to indeterminate, but no one was ever brought to justice over that. Now, also worsening things, at least for the kids, just a few months after this went down, the father would remarry. And as you can probably guess, you know, this didn't really go for that well, right? The kids didn't really get along, all that kind of stuff. Danny had, I think it was six siblings. He was very close with his brother, Victor, who is older. And Victor, you know, was there the day that this went down, all this stuff. I mean, Victor is very prevalent in this story and will become more prevalent uh, as we go further. So as you can see with these tragic events involving not only these missing girls in town that end up, we find out what happens to them, but the situation with Rena, the mother, these are very, you know, life shaping events, but also they're forming opinions of the police, the attorney general's office, things of these nature for people like Danny, as well as his brother named Victor. Now, on that note, knowing all that we know now about these past crimes, things of this nature, how they were handled, how they were not handled, the unsolved nature of it, let's go ahead and fast forward in time back to that day at Danny's property. His friends are there working. They hear this loud crack. Danny's on the ground and what will ultimately become of him and his case. 
So that day there on Danny's property, he had a friend there named Richard who he had sold a car to, but that friend was keeping the car at Danny's property while he was like working on it, fixing it up, using his tools, all that kind of a thing. Now, another young man was coming over to help. He was going to do some painting, I believe. Now, his name was Court Burton. And this is a young man whom Danny really looked at like, you know what? This kid's going places. He's got good work ethic. You know, he, he just really thought very highly of him. Now, this was very much in contrast as to how he felt about the three sons of the woman whom he was dating. Now, her name was Ruth Celeste, and like I said, she had three sons. Danny basically was like, you know what? They're lazy. They are no good for nothing. The one son that he felt like, you know what? He might have something. He felt like, you know what? He, or he was more like into the stuff that Danny was in. Danny was very much like a guy's guy, right? Sound like he had kind of like ruggedly handsome looks. He could pretty much like, it sounds like, get any woman he really wanted to. And he was into guy stuff, fixing cars, you know, guns, this kind of thing, whatever. So... Some of the sons didn't sound like they were into that stuff, and the one that did, he was like, well, he leaves tools everywhere, he's lazy, he's just, you know, he wasn't vibing with them, is what I'm getting at, okay? So, d this other kid would come over and help, and like I said, it sounded to me like Danny was like, you know, like the son that he didn't have type situation. Now, also stopping by that day were a couple of guys, sounded like they were from Canada, they had, or Danny was doing some kind of work for them, maybe making a fuel tank, something of this nature, so they were going to be stopping by as well. So, Danny's on the property, he's in a different area than his friend and the other kid, and the loud crack happens, they go, they get there, they're not really sure what took place, his friend Richard sends a younger kid off to go call for help. 911 apparently hadn't been put into this area yet, so they were calling for like fire rescue. A neighbor comes over, and again, nobody really knew what happened at first. And so they really thought he had been electrocuted, like his equipment was there on the ground, still going. So that's what took place. Now, like I said earlier in the video, Richard tries doing the, you know, the chest compressions, this kind of stuff, waiting for fire rescue to come. He'll start to realize like, what is this wet liquid here? Things start to kind of come together like, what th this isn't making sense. Only once the rescue people got there and things started, you know, unfolding a little bit, did they realize this was way more than just Danny getting accidentally electrocuted. So remember Danny's brother that I mentioned, Victor? Well, he would receive a phone call, you know, something's wrong, something's really bad wrong with your brother, he's being rushed to the hospital. Now, like I said, Victor was an older brother, he was a biker, he was actually also a welder. Um, and he was actually another kind of ladies man, it sounded like, and he was having like a fling with a married woman. And he had done this before, it didn't end well, as a lot of times these don't. Uh, but Victor sounded to me like he kind of looked after Danny. It also sounded to me like some family members looked at Victor as like a bad influence on Danny, like in younger years and stuff. Almost like, you know what, it's, you know, his, it's Victor's fault that Danny got involved in biking. It's Victor's fault that blank happened. That kind of a thing. Now, one thing that was kind of thrown out there at first, and Victor thought is he was like, oh my gosh, what if the husband of the woman who I am dating found out what's going on, looked up, you know, basically showed up at the Ron Paquette's home because Danny had a business, right? And so he's like, what if he looked up and it was, you know, he's thinking that's the Paquette and he went over there and shot Danny thinking it was me. You see where I'm going with this. Also, the whole thing of, okay, I always get blamed for whatever goes wrong with Danny, so there's that. Now, that was another thing going on. Another thing going on that same day is that there was a lot of hunters in the area, and this is kind of where things would end up being settled at. So there's a lot of hunting going on, people target practicing in certain areas, stuff like that. Remember, this is kind of like a rural type area. And authorities would actually end up asking people to bring their guns in to try and match up to figure out, you know, it, it, did somebody's gun accidentally go off or, you know, somebody accidentally do this. So they wanted hunters and people like that, the town people, whatever, to bring their guns in. You can imagine, I mean, some people did, right? Because that would kind of mess with you, right? To be like, well, was it my gun that did it? Right? I mean, it's, it's kind of an interesting psychological experiment, but that ain't the point of this video. So you can also imagine a lot of people didn't want to bring their guns in, so that didn't really ever go anywhere. Now, it would actually even take them a little bit of time to find the bullet to begin with, and it's interesting how somebody found the bullet is it was a lineman. There was uh, issues with the telephone, and they found the bullet lodge in a telephone pole. So everything was very odd about 
about it. Everything was very weird and there was just no real answers in the beginning. Another thing that made it even more bizarre is that once, you know, they figured out what exactly happened to him, so on and so forth to get him to the hospital, which it didn't take long, he was pronounced deceased, is the bullet, I mean, it was like a direct hit to his heart, right? I mean, it was like perfect. So that whole dynamic of, well, if it was an accident, I mean, what a perfect accident. So there's all this confusion, all this stuff going on, people are getting involved, and then obviously coming to the realization, like for uh, Victor, you know, okay, this is, you know, I've lost my brother, right? So let's take a look at what some of the possible motives were and whatnot. So the police start to ask around town. They're trying to figure out, was it an accident? You know, what, what's going on? And they're talking to everyone that knows, you know, Danny. And some very interesting things will start coming to the surface about Danny and his relationship with others. So you remember his friend Richard who was there working on the car. So Richard would say, you know what, uh, I've kind of heard like rumblings of Danny having a side chick in the neighborhood in addition to Ruth, but the side chick was like underage. Um, and he was like, you know what, Danny's even kind of like hit on my own daughter and I've actually had to talk to her about it, uh, you know, because it, he was nervous that like something that the daughter could come between him and Danny. Now, I was not able to figure out how old his daughter was. The way it was written to me almost sounds like she was of age. Regardless, it didn't sound good though, okay? So I was just like, that's really suspect. Now, again, remember, they're trying to figure out did Richard do this? Did the kid who showed up did it? All this kind of stuff, right? So if you're looking for motive, I mean, this is major. Now, what was also kind of weird about this is that Richard was basically like, I work all the time. I basically don't have any free time. Danny's my only friend and I just really don't want to lose that friendship. And so that's why even though there was a weird thing with him hitting on my daughter, I didn't really, you know, have a confrontation about it. And so for that, I was like, Okay. Now, even the cleaning lady at Danny's will be like, you know what? I won't go out. I won't go there with somebody else. Yeah, I'm very uncomfortable. He hits on me. And I'm just like, okay, that's not good either. Now, also, some of the neighbors would say this whole mentioning of him going out with some underage girl in the neighborhood or in town. And so that story keeps coming up over and over again. Now, there was also a story mentioned from another neighbor, you know, townsfolk, whoever, about one of Danny's exes taking their kids and up and leaving to Alaska. And that there was also rumblings about him having done things to one of their daughters. And so that's not good either. Now, remember how I said that Danny was a biker? So Danny had actually gotten into a bike wreck uh, years before, and he was carrying a woman on the back of his bike. Her name was Diane Boothby, and she would end up falling off the bike, cracking her head. I think she was in the hospital for like five days or so before she lost her life. And even though it would be ruled that it was the car's fault, like a car cut him off or something like that, or they T-boned or something like that, but it was not his fault. Uh, her family obviously wasn't happy about that, right? And then Victor and Danny's family kind of blamed Victor for even getting Danny into biking in the first place. So you can kind of see how these patterns begin with their own family going and blaming one another and all this kind of stuff. Now, on that flip note, there would be neighbors that spoke very highly of Danny, right? And they'd be like, he's a real stand-up guy, you know, re very reliable, you know, didn't have anything bad to say about him. Also on the flip note, there's the three sons who absolutely did not get along with him. And I'm talking down to like fist fight kind of stuff. And it actually somebody else in town who was like a, the taught uh, karate, something like that, self-defense or something. Danny had basically gone to them saying, hey, I want to learn some moves because you know this isn't over. Now, this is about the son of the woman he's dating. OK, so that's not good either. Now also what is very kind of sad, tragic, but ties us all in and kind of shows you just the trajectory of all of these generations, Danny's funeral would end up being held at the same church that his mother's was. So if it's motive that you're looking for, there's obviously plenty of people in that town with motive to do what happened to Danny, right? So in order to then focus a little bit more in on what exactly happened that day to him, why it happened, who did it, what happened, the whole nine yards. We need to first keep uncovering secrets about Danny 
some of his family members, and specifically his love life. So Danny had been married to a woman named Denise. Now Danny and Denise had history. They had dated, you know, in high school, and actually when she was around, I believe 16 years old, he got her pregnant. Now again, this is like a different time, a different era, right? So what happened when this took place is she was shipped off somewhere, and then she came back without child. So the child, it would be, his, actually it was a son, and we'll talk about him in just a second very quickly because we'll come back to him later in the video. Um, but he was put up for adoption, he went away, she comes back into town, and she is basically forbidden from ever talking to Danny again. So like I said, the child's name was Keith. Now, Keith would end up later in life finding out who his birth parents were, you know, that it was Danny and Denise. Now, he actually never ended up meeting Danny, but he would end up speaking at trial many years later. So whether they liked it or not, life had to move on with Danny and Denise. So Danny will end up meeting this kind of like what sounded like a hippie chick type woman. Uh, her name was Stephanie. And now this is when like the war in Vietnam was going on, this kind of stuff. And so Danny ends up getting drafted. And I mean, you know how that went back then. So when push came to shove though, he ends up not being sent to Vietnam, but actually to Germany. Now, Danny would end up getting Stephanie pregnant. She would even, with the baby, come over to Germany for a little bit. Things with the relationship start to get a little... Uh, and so she comes back over to the States. Now, once Danny did return from the war, things went very down south. Like, things soured with them. Things turned physical. She takes baby girl. She divorces him. She's... They're gone. So now, in the meantime, you know, life moved on for Denise as well. She had met a guy. They get hitched. They have a baby girl. Her name is Melanie. Things don't go well with that. She gets divorced. She moves to Alaska. So one time, Denise, she's coming home to visit, something like that. She ends up hooking back up with Danny. They meet up, and this, like, old flame is there again. And, you know, they're going down, like, this memory lane. They're like, you know what? We could start a family. We could find our son. You know, remember the son that was put up for adoption? You know, we could make this work now. Like, things are different or whatever. And so this is the trajectory that they start off on. And so they end up having two kids of their own. And when this takes place, Danny's like, you know what? I don't want Melanie to be like an outsider, a third world, whatever, uh, whatever you want to call it. He ends up adopting her so she will have the Paquette last name. So you would think this is awesome. This is great. Here we go. So they're living their life and things, they, they aren't going well. And so Denise takes the three kids and she moves more like into the city area. This ain't, Danny ain't having this, right? He's showing up. He's showing up at her job. He's stalking her around town. He's getting crazy, right? She has a restraining order against him. One day he goes to her place. He almost suffocates her. You know, breaks this restraining order. I mean, he's getting completely unhinged with her. Now, all this ends up, like, coming to a head. And one day he's chasing her down in traffic. And she drives straight to the police station. Now, like I said, he ends up violating his restraining order. And he will end up actually going to the state mental hospital for like a year. So all this is going on and now it would be said that like while he was in the hospital that some people there were like, you know, tell, telling Denise like some of the, maybe the daughters or whoever was basically like, you need to like, you need to move away, right? Like this guy's not like, no. Um, but regardless, he ends up getting out. They figure out a custody situation. And so there's all that. So that, you know, is a little bit odd or whatever, but nonetheless, it is what it is. We see this happen all the time in these cases, unfortunately. So one day he goes to pick up the girls or whatever, and she's gone, place is cleared out, everything's just, mm -mm, she's gone, right? So, which is probably honestly one of the best things that she could have done. So what had happened, which obviously Danny didn't know, she didn't want him to know where any of them went, she had moved back to Alaska with her girls. However, things weren't really going that well out there. It sounds like she was just, you know, making ends meet, that kind of a thing. It sounds like Melanie really wasn't too happy out there. And so it was a scenario where it was like, you know what, I'm having all these struggles financially, Melanie's not happy, so on and so forth. So this is where we will be introduced to Denise's brother, Philip, and his wife, Kathy. Now, Kathy at this time was an assistant attorney general. 
they had stability, they had all this kind of stuff, and they lived back kind of close to where Danny was, but like, you know, not like they weren't neighbors basically, right? They lived in the same area, that kind of thing, but far enough away to where they weren't involved or whatever. So they were telling Denise, look, you know, you can send Melanie back here to this area. She can go to this high school. She won't, will be, you know, 15, 20 minutes away from Danny. Nobody will know she's here. You know, all this kind of stuff. And it will work out. We can give her the proper, you know, stuff that a teenager needs or whatever uh, kind of a thing. So this would work out for Denise. This would enable her to keep going, things going there. And it would give Melanie the chance to basically go back home, right? To where the, she had known life to be. So pause for one second before we go any further. Keep in mind when we were talking about what took place with Danny's mother, Rena, and the attorney general's office offered this very flimsy, like, oh, she did this to herself and all that kind of stuff. So just keep that in mind. So Danny's former sister-in-law is an attorney general who is secretly getting ready to have his daughter move back in with her, or move in with her, go to a high school, live all this kind of life. Now, one thing that would come out is in like the months leading up to, or before what happened to Danny, Philip and Kathy were trying to get legal guardianship of Melanie. However, in that state, this time, whatever, it's kind of different in different places, he would have been notified of this. And so they basically stopped this because they're like, no, including Melanie, nobody wanted him to know she was in this area, including Melanie. She didn't want that. And they knew it would be drama. I mean, you've already heard. I mean, this guy was coming unhinged at certain things. So they put a complete stop on that whole situation. So now there's also one thing that we haven't discussed yet about Melanie and the reasoning in her not wanting to be with, you know, her stepfather and him to know that. Philip would know this, and obviously by proxy Kathy, there were allegations that Danny had done things to Melanie, you know, in an abusive type way, the, the essay. And so there was that going on. So this is another reason why Melanie is not wanting to be around her stepfather, any of this. And we'll, as we'll learn as we keep going, this becomes kind of like a known secret among certain crowds. And this is what is very prevalent with this case and this town and these crimes are these little groups of people that know these secrets about these different crimes that go on. And it, it absolutely baffles my mind. So now we need to focus the lens even closer and onto Melanie, these allegations, and how all of this would collide to eventually shatter lives. So remember earlier how when I said the police were asking around and getting intel on Danny and like what had happened that day, and neighbors were saying some stuff about, you know what, I think Denise had left Alaska. There's something about him. He did some things with one of the girls. Well, now it's time to look a little bit deeper into that allegation. So Melanie was like three years old when her mother Denise and her biological father split, and he was basically out of the picture for a long time. So like I said earlier, Danny comes into the picture. They have the other two kids. They adopt. He adopts her. She has the same last name. Now, it would be kind of become like this known thing of like, you know what, Melanie's like, it, it, dad abuses, or you know, stepdad at least, or dad, whatever, I don't know what she called him. But he was abusive towards her mother, Denise. He badgered her a lot. Uh, it sounds like he had these like kind of unreasonable expectations. Like she had to kind of do crazy stuff around the house. It, it sounds like he was an overall, just like not a nice guy to her, right? So all that's going on. And then as we've learned, there's these allegations, you know, from Melanie about him doing these things or whatever. So all that adds up. So remember, they go to Alaska, she comes back to her aunt and uncle's house, she's living there, life's going along. Now, what it really sounds like is she, she wasn't happy in Alaska, she wasn't doing good out there. When she was back in this high school in New Hampshire, it sounds like she was really flourishing there. Now, the school, the high school in New Hampshire was small. They didn't have a soccer team there, a girls soccer team. And so she actually tried out for and made the boys soccer team. She was the only girl to have done it. And now the guys were very accepting. Like they really liked Melanie, right? They were happy to have her as a teammate and she was an excellent teammate. She was really, really good. Now it also sounds like back in Alaska, you know, this is a bigger place, this kind of stuff 
she didn't like really shine there or stick out, if you will. And uh, because they had their own girls soccer team, that kind of stuff. It just sounded like it was not her zone there, right? And I can get that. So she's doing really well here in New Hampshire at this high school. Things are going along fine. Now, we need to also talk about another guy who will become, in a very tragic way, very important and prevalent in Melanie's life. And his name is Eric Winhurst. So Eric was like the captain of the soccer ball team. Sounded like a really handsome guy, you know, kind of like real stand up type of dude. Now he, I've, I've read in a couple of different places and I can't really figure out hundred percent. So we'll look at both angles of this. So in some places it says that, you know, they were dating or whatever. For the most part, the way it seems is they were not dating and it was more like this platonic bigger brother type of relationship between the two. And it sounds like she definitely liked him. She was goo goo over him, that kind of a thing. She would say later, like many, many moons later, that she was just excited to be able to spend a day with him, right? So, but from him, it doesn't sound like he was into her in that way. So I, I don't know if anything ever happened between them or not. I guess at this point is it irrelevant though. So when the shooting took place, right, and all this stuff starts becoming unearthed, they interview her, obviously, right, when they start hearing these allegations and stuff. Now she's like 15 at the time. And so they go, they talk to her. Now, side note on this, so remember her aunt is Kathy. Now this is kind of getting like, you know, here's the attorney general. This is unearthing like all of this family drama, trauma and that kind of thing. So this is very like delicate, right? So there's all that going on and that will become more prevalent with like Paquette's family and whatnot and their viewpoint on attorney generals, the police and all this kind of stuff. But regardless, they go, they interview Melanie and they're like, let's find out what's up with this. Now, during this interview, they will find out where she's like, yeah, you know what? I didn't like him. He was abusive towards my mother. And she will confirm, yes, he did, you know, SA me. And he also was doing it to another neighborhood girl that would come over and play. So she is asked, obviously, I mean, this just like adding up to not looking good, right? So she's asked like, look, where were you, what you were doing? And she's like, oh, well, me and my friend, Eric, we went to this game, we were gone all day, that's what we did. So let's pause there and talk for a moment about Eric because clearly they're gonna wanna talk to Eric too to find out, you know, let's confirm this alibi, all this kind of stuff, right? Now, Eric would confirm, yeah, you know what? I met her from the soccer team connection, that kind of thing. We're friends. And yeah, you know what? We went to this game together. I picked her up, we went to the game. I had her back at such and such time. And that was that kind of for a little bit, right? I mean, there was nothing really to make more from it. However, once the police left and all that settled, Eric's father, his name was John, he would contact authorities and be like, hey, look, after y'all left, Eric told me some more stuff. Uh, he said that Melanie had actually told him about the abuse allegations as well. So there was that. Now at the time, this didn't really go anywhere. Um, again, both of their alibis match. I mean, these are high school students, right? No one's really expecting anything from these kind of people. But that being said, there was something inside Eric that was gnawing at him and that was eating at him that he couldn't put his head down or rest easy over it. And in fact, later that day, he would go to his older brother's home and his sister-in-law's house, and he would tell them that he was indeed the one that had taken Danny Paquette's life with the gun. Now, in turn, they would end up telling his parents. And again, like I've said before, this became a known secret amongst a very small amount of people that Eric had done this. But that's not the only dirty little secret that was happening amongst Eric's family. And in fact, one would come out years later that he would disclose in court and trial and stuff like this that was very shocking and that added somewhat of a reasoning as to things happened. But at the time, this wasn't known to anyone else, but really the immediate family. And we're gonna talk about it in just a second, but before we get there, we need to look a little bit further, deeper into Eric and his life so we can kind of understand and appreciate what exactly took place during the years where nothing was really happening with the case. So eventually he enlisted in the Marines and he moved away. But now before he could graduate boot camp, and he was gonna actually become an expert sniper. 
he got bitten by a red ant and he had this really bad allergic reaction to it, which caused him to medically discharge him and he had to return home. You can imagine he was completely crushed. But then Eric would actually end up moving to Colorado. He would start a totally new life out there. He had a new job, a, a new woman in his life. All this stuff would go on, except there was still that dirty little secret gnawing away at him. So then one day he gets a phone call, a phone call that he probably knew he would get at some point. And it's his father saying, you know what, uh, they've got some pretty damning evidence. It's, you're probably going to need to come home. And so Eric eventually does this. He has to kind of walk away from this life that he had. He makes up an excuse with his job and whatnot, and he returns home. So now keep in mind, look at the Paquettes, Victor, the, the siblings, that family. All these years are going by, and we see kind of like what's been going on with Eric and Melanie and this kind of thing. But the Paquettes don't have an answer as to what happened to Danny, right? They also never got an answer as to what happened to the mother. So... You know, that's going on. Now, there will start to be this connection made, like, with Victor and them of Danny's death has something to do with the mothers, right? Like, maybe it's whoever did that, which, you know, obviously, it's most likely Edward, but that's allegedly. So, that's going on. Now, what ends up happening is they're making the rounds. They're doing local TV shows. I mean, these cases were even, like, on Unsolved Mysteries, all this kind of stuff. You know, with Danny Paquette and, like, what exactly happened. So, they're making all of these rounds while this other stuff is going on in the background. Well, the end result of doing all this publicity and stuff is they receive a couple of anonymous letters authorities do at least and in these anonymous letters these letters go they were clearly written by two different people it kind of like two different viewpoints of these crimes but what ends up happening is these letters are describing what took place and they're pinpointing Eric and Melanie in these crimes essentially they're saying you know what Eric went and did this for Melanie because of what Danny Paquette did to her and it's pretty much like a known secret in town amongst you know, certain people that this is what he did and also the, another letter was basically saying Melanie told me that this happened so each of them being obviously teenagers had had their moments where they told certain people right so there's other people in town that definitely know this now they weren't privy to it they weren't there to pinpoint it but I mean who goes around saying this you know how teenagers are so and they will talk later on and you know Eric will have some moments of discussing times where he talked to some guys about it Melanie talked to some people about it and obviously knowing that kind of a secret and the rumor mill going around I mean that kind of eats away at people as well so enough time have gone by things change allegiances change all this kind of stuff to where when these letters came out, I mean, this was taken pretty seriously and it kind of reinvigorated the case again. Now, one of the letters specifically would talk about a friend of Eric's named Matt who would help him with his alibi and it would kind of outline what happened that day. And so it would talk about how that day Eric and Melanie took a car and there was apparently like this kind of like side road, back road type thing near the Paquette property. And it was far enough away to where they wouldn't be seen or whatever. And so they took this car and went down this road. Now, a huge part of this case that will become very, you know, gray zone, and we'll talk about that later when we get more into the trial, is that it will be said that Melanie basically pointed out who Danny was. Up until this time, Eric had never even met Danny, right? He didn't even know what he looked like. So this letter will outline that. This happens. Eric does the shot, they get back in the car, they say this is what we're going to say happened. They ask, Eric gets his friend Matt to line this alibi up as well. And then life goes on. So as you can imagine when this letter comes out and it's like detailing all of this stuff that kind of is making sense, right? When, when they're like, wait, okay, it was dumb from far away, the shot, this would explain this, all that. So like I said, this gets the case going again. A reporter also gets involved trying to help crack the case. So they're going around, they're talking to the former high school friends and students and all this type of stuff. And as you know, this gets all this rumblings going up. Well, this is when, like I told you earlier, that... Eric's dad called him and was like, oh yeah, you need to come home. This is not looking good for you. Now, obviously one thing that happens is the investigators are like, well, we need to talk to Eric and Melanie again, right? So they're reaching out to Melanie and she's 
talking about like that was so long ago you know i don't remember this i don't remember that well she basically is finally like look now she's moved away she doesn't live around there she's basically like i will answer your questions but you need to write them out because i think it would be so triggering just write them out for me now they normally wouldn't do that but they're like you know what We're, let's just give it a shot so they send her these questions and basically nothing really comes of this right now during this time also eric had lawyered up and basically his lawyers were like he ain't talking to y'all any questions you have you need to ask us so which was probably the best thing he could have done at that time so there's that going on now it, the investigators will also end up interviewing a pretty much this neighbor girl obviously she was in high school at this time but now she's more of like a grown-up woman and but still living in the same house that kind of a thing so she's saying you know what? i don't really remember a lot from that day but i do remember this car uh, being on the road and she will describe a general description like color type car that matches the same kind of car that Eric was driving during that time. So eventually the investigators are like, you know what, we're just going to have to like go out to Melanie and, and talk to her in person. Like there's no other way to really do this, right? So they go out there and she's like, okay, you know, I'll talk to you. She goes down to the station and she's answering the questions and this is all pretty much going a certain way, right? I mean, because this is a long time ago, she tells them all this stuff. And then they're basically like, well, we want to verify this with a polygraph test. And so this is where things will get a little bit dicey for her. So it ended up coming out in all this conversation and whatnot, because basically at this point, Melanie is like, I'm ready to talk, right? And so she is saying that she was, you know, obviously going to counseling, this kind of a thing with her aunt. Um, during this time and this is when the abuse comes out she didn't want that to take place like she, she this was a secret she was like wanting to probably take to her grave right at least this is what she's saying and so she's talking about this and she's saying that obviously the therapist has to report this and so it was going to be a scenario where an investigation was going to take place and in her world she was like oh my god this is going to become this whole thing where he's going to know that i'm in the area an investigation is going to happen and he's going to know i told on him like she's afraid for her life basically right now she will say that she goes to eric with this information and is telling him this now also side note remember how i said earlier that there was like these family secrets with eric's family and we'll talk about those later well now it's later so another thing that had come out that eric would talk about later you know down the road or whatever is that during this time where what happened happened he had found out that his own father was doing the same thing to his stepsisters so his stepsisters had allegedly confronted his father john about this Eric found out about this. I mean, I want to say like a week before he did this to Danny. And so it was almost like this weird thing of those feelings he had towards his own father, he took out on Danny. Now the statute of limitations were too old by the time all of this happened to bring charges against John. Uh, but nonetheless, this was one of the excuses or reasons given for what took place mentally and psychologically. So as you can see, the police's case is becoming more and more prevalent. Obviously they have Melanie who's cooperating, all this kind of stuff. They're going around town and more and more people they're talking to. It's just like this known thing amongst these people that, oh yo, Danny did that. You know, it's just this known thing that everybody knew, but they kept quiet about it because so many people had their own reasonings for not liking Danny. And then when you get into the whole thing of the abuse thing, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I mean, people are, you know, they're not gonna tell on Eric, right? Now also closing the case in on Eric, the girl he was dating this time, I think her name was Heather, she would get pulled into this and he would be very, you know, sad that, and apologetic that she had to get mixed up in this, but she would end up having to testify to a grand jury about everything she knew about what happened, what Eric had told her about what he did that day. Now, she would confirm the story about Eric's father and the stepsisters and the abuse and them confronting him, and she would say that, yeah, Eric believed that his dad did that to them. So that's huge right now she was actually given immunity for this so she you know could say all that she knew she would say that eric told her that on his trip out to colorado he had chopped up the weapon used 
and kind of dispersed it along the way and disposed of it that way. Now she said that Eric, like I said, was very upset that she got involved in it, but he did ask her at one point to lie to authorities for him. Um, and they would end up breaking up and then getting back together. I mean, it sounded like a very tumultuous situation between the two of them and the legal situation that took place. So finally in December of 2005, he would be arraigned and charged with first degree M charges in regards to what he did to Danny. Now, one thing that I thought was also interesting about this story is that the prosecutor would actually have to explain themselves, especially to like prominent people in the town, as to why they were aggressively pursuing charges against Danny. Because a lot of people were like, why are you even doing this? Like, I mean, why are you doing this? And the prosecutor would say, you know what? We might feel a certain way about this, that, or the other, but at the end of the day, you can't go and take someone's life based on an assumption or a rumor or whatever, basically. Basically. Because again, at the end of the day, Danny didn't even know, or I'm sorry, Eric didn't even know Danny. He 100% was just going on Melanie's word, that kind of thing. So there you go. And we'll talk about my feelings about the whole vigilante thing and all that because this case to me was so interesting and the way it was just laid out as to kind of the way it just made me feel, right? But we'll get to that in a minute. So Eric would end up taking a plea deal to second degree M charges, and he would get sentenced between 15 and 36 years for prison time. Now, the Paquette family was not happy about this, like, at all, okay? Now, at the sentencing, Victor, his brother, basically vowed, he was like, I will make sure that you never get out. I am going to always be there. You know, we are not cool with this situation. This is not justice. Like, no. People were kind of jeering at him. I mean, it was it, it was dramatic. Now, one thing that was interesting is Victor would later say that the family never really wanted to do the plea deal, but they had one family member who had a, a diagnosis of cancer. It was not good. And so to avoid like that level of stress and everything, they ended up doing the plea deal so that they didn't have to go through this crazy trial and all this stuff, right? Victor would also accuse the prosecutors of protecting the Winhurst family as well as Melanie's aunt, Kathy, who was then at that point a, a judge in the county. So she had gone from the attorney general, now she's a judge. Remember how earlier we talked about what happened to Victor and Danny's mother? And, you know, the attorney general offered this flimsy excuse. So you see how they have this history back then of that, of this mistrust. Well, now they're here with this and they're like, how has this gone this long, you know, unsolved, so on and so forth. It is also very important to understand that Victor and the Paquette family, they were not trying to say that Danny did this to Melanie. You know, they were not down with that excuse whatsoever. Now, it's also interesting that at one point when Melanie had moved back to Alaska and she was going to school over there, she apparently had made up the story about being assaulted there and told Eric this. So, you know, we'll get into my thought processes on it. Now, she would say that basically she was, you know, Hungry for attention, any kind at that point. She had a lot of issues going on because of what had happened to her earlier in life. And so, you know, she wasn't trying to say that that was anything good or whatever, but obviously, you know, that didn't look good. Melanie was going to end up pleading guilty to hindering apprehension. She had basically like cut a deal for her, you know, helping work. She had placed several recorded phone calls to Eric. She kind of helped, you know, catch him, if you will. Now, one of the things that she was saying in this, and this is going to become prevalent here in a second, is that, you know, she had told him she didn't know he was going to do what he did. That kind of a thing, you know, like she didn't really plan that. She didn't want him to take Danny's life, that type of situation. So she had moved on with life, right? She was living in Wyoming. She had a husband, she had kids, and she had actually come out to New Hampshire several times to help police and do all this type of stuff. So they were very much like, look, we're going to cut her a plea deal. It's, you know, we're cool with this. She's done a lot of help. We were able to get Danny you know, we're cool with this. So they, you know, she comes out, she's thinking, let's get this behind us. And they go to have her day in court. Now, during this time, the, um, the Paquette family is there, you know, Victor, all them, and they're actually more PO'd with her than they are Eric because they're looking at it like she has schemed this, she has lied, she has manipulated everybody, and at the end of the day, you know, Danny was her stepfather, right? So at the sentencing, when people are talking, all that kind of stuff, and, you know, they're kind of going over stuff with the judge, the judge is basically like, I'm not really buying the fact 
that she didn't point Danny out, you know, or that she didn't really want this to happen. He wasn't believing that. She is a very smart young woman. And basically the judge was just like, I don't, I don't buy that at all. I think that you have not taken full accountability for your part in the crime. Essentially someone had to point him out, right? How would Eric know this? And so to get that far in a case and be pointing your finger at somebody else, but also still to kind of have that on your own back porch, it was not looking good for this judge. Now, even though a lot of the investigators, the police, all these people are very sympathetic with her because of the abuse, that wasn't really enough for the judge. So the judge ends up rejecting her deal and he sentences her to three to six years in prison for the charges. So she's there. I mean, she was thinking she was going back home, right? Her kids are there and they whisk her away. And apparently like the Paquette's love every second of that right they were just like absolutely so she gets sentenced to prison as well so both melanie and eric they go off they start doing their prison sentences now melanie will go up first and she will actually end up getting her sentence reduced down to 15 months right she goes back before the court they they redo this and they let her out so Eric doesn't have so much luck. Now his lawyers will go before and say, um, hey, excuse me, she got out already. You know, we no, we need to come back and revisit Eric's case. So he doesn't get his charges dismissed or anything like that earlier. But he, what will happen with him is, I mean, actually recently, 2020, I believe it was, um, right at like a little under the 15 year mark, he goes before a parole board. Now Eric has like thrived in prison, right? He's like done all this stuff clean record, you name it. He had gotten into the work release program. So he was like, you know, he had a job, lined up a place to live. He was going to be living with his mother and taking care of her. She's very elderly. And so the parole board was like, you know what? It, we, we can't see why we should keep you in here. Now, remember how Victor had said, we're going to always be there. Victor would be at the parole hearings. He would have his the brother's button on there and he would remind the court, these are cold blooded killers, right? That he should have to serve his entire sentence. And you know, even Victor, this one was like, he went to you know, work release. He hasn't even been incarcerated for 15 full years, you know, but the parole board was not hearing it and they allowed uh, Winhurst to go home. So that is the crazy twisted story of Danny Paquette, Edward Coolidge, Melanie Paquette, all these people involved in this, right? His mother, all nine yards. When I was looking into this and started like reading the book, reading articles, all this kind of stuff, you know, this is one of those cases where you start off feeling a certain way. And then as information came out, like, you know, specifically about the abuse and stuff like that, I was like, ugh. You know, once I started learning about the things he was doing with like the neighborhood people and stuff like that. That's where this kind of changed around. And it gives you this kind of more perspective of, okay, yeah, I mean, I can kind of see how Eric went and did that. The one thing with Eric's situation that I found a little bit like, huh, is the fact that he didn't know Danny. You know, he didn't, wasn't any kind of firsthand person of this. It's also very interesting that his own father was accused of the same stuff, but he didn't come after his father. He came after Danny. Psychologically, I find that very interesting, right? Now, I've, for all that being said, you know, as it shows in the thing, Danny's family didn't really believe the allegations for Melanie, that kind of stuff. And so that's the part that, you know, I believe Melanie, right? I believe that she felt those ways. I believe all that. Now, I also do believe that she pointed to Danny out, right? Now, does that make her, you know, more culpable or not? I, I didn't even really consider that. I thought it was interesting how the judge was upset about that and wanted to give her a harsher sentence. So there's that part. Now, when you rewind back to the beginning, the origins of Edward Coolidge and, you know, the poor souls who he took their lives and how that rounded out to Danny and Victor's mother, you know, that part I find heartbreaking. I personally think that Edward took their mother's life, right? A hundred percent. I don't doubt it at all, right? I do not think he was brought to justice for that. I personally don't think he should probably have been let out, you know? <laughs> so... I also can see how that totally formed how Danny and Edward and the other people viewed police, viewed the, uh, the, the attorney general, that office, their decisions, things of that nature. So it all just kind of adds up and unfolds for me. I'm curious what you think. You know, how do you feel about the fact that Eric took Danny's life? How do you feel about, you know, do you believe Melanie? What are your thoughts on it? 
again, I just, I thought this was a completely an interesting case. So many different psychological aspects to look at, so many legal aspects to look at, that type thing. Because my whole thing is this, let's see if what Melanie was saying was true and she didn't want all that to come out, yada, yada, yada. My opinion is this, what happened to Danny was going to happen to him at some point. It was a matter of, was it gonna happen in prison or not? I personally just hate to see young people have thrown their lives away on him over that. It's almost like, you know what, let prison justice take care of that, if that makes sense. Um, so there's that. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think about down in the comments. Again, thank you to everybody who makes these videos possible, makes this channel, all my channels possible. If you're still watching, thank you. Show some love down in the comment section. Uh, for all of the innocent victims in this case, for Melanie, for the two girls that lost their life, and for Rena, because I feel like she did the right thing, and I feel like Edward Coolidge took her life, and that was not something that probably should have happened. Um, and so that said, again, this is one of those that just really makes me ponder. I'm still thinking about it right now as I'm talking. So anyways, thank you to all the Sofa Squad members for making this happen. I really appreciate it. And it's showing me back at this damn sofa again. Well, I'll see you soon.